Hello and welcome to the Baby Giants Investing Podcast. Join us as we chat about the weird and wild world of small cap investing, all while searching for the precious few fast-growing businesses that have a shot at becoming industry giants. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. Podcast guests and their clients may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. All right, we'll kick it off. We've got Andrew back. We've got Claude back. Andrew, you're all recovered from your battle with one of our recurring enemies on the show, COVID. Feeling all right? <laughs> I am. Yeah, I am. Very good. Uh, yep. All good. All good. It was my first go around. It was lots of fun. Uh, highly recommend it. Oh, you this know? is the first time you've had it? Yeah, I dodged oh, it for like three and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I have no uh, idea how you did that with two children. Well, they had you, it. You tested, hadn't you tested positive before but just didn't have any symptoms? Or? No. No. No, although I did, I did start to, I did start to believe that I was special and immune. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it was, it was that pride before fall moment. It was you were looking a lot of doorknobs. I remember that. Yeah, no, no, yeah. I bring it on. I mean, I'm, I'm invincible. invincible. Uh huh. Yeah, no, but I'm all better. Invincible. Yeah, all better. Okay, cool. Very good. All right, let's kick off with some good news. This one I got it's quite market related. I think diamond prices are in free fall in one key corner of the market. De Beers has been forced to aggressively slash diamond prices because everyone, or a large enough number of people, are switching. Americans are choosing engagement rings made from lab-grown stones instead. So we can now oh. grow a stone in a lab, and people are choosing that. So the synthetic diamond industry has paid special attention to this category, where consumers are especially price sensitive. Yeah, I just think this is kind of cool. Rationality kind of like cool thing of prevails. Plus, you know. I, I was always one of those things that's like, what the hell is wrong with people, right? Like it, it is sort of, I, I know synthetic lab grown doesn't have the same the appeal as getting a, you know, eight-year-old to like dig in horrible, <laughs> dangerous conditions in Africa and, and you know, for whatever reason. But yeah. like you know, basic uh, chemistry, physics will say that they are they are chemically identical, right? It's just an arrangement of, of of carbon atoms. So it's just sort of like, and in fact, in fact, as I understand it, the lab grown ones are actually better. It's a more pure crystal. So if you mm-hmm. if you want you know the, the the best most pristine crystalline structure, lab grown is is the way to go. And yet for ages, people just it, they poo pooed it. So it's just it's I actually I actually see this as a I mean, I'm encouraged that there's some rationality out there where people will go, yeah, I will take the superior, cheaper product without yeah. the human misery. Thank you very much. And and you know what, De Beers, too bad, so sad. You had a good run and there is there is a whole pod we could do on De Beers, by the way. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people know the story, but yeah, they're not good guys. They're not good yeah. guys. And some of the uh, marketing they did, right? That idea of like, you should spend a few months salary. Like they just implanted that uh, idea yep. in the collective, you know, unconscious or whatever. And it's just like completely made up. Like there's no reason that you should spend no. like X number of months salary on a ring, but it's just like, yeah, you should do this. It did, and it just, and it worked. It worked, right? And and then the other, the other thing is as well is that diamonds were never the traditional there was never it, it, it's a it's a recent tradition in the span of human history it's not something that goes back like you know hundreds and hundreds of years it was like the yeah. early 20th century that they mm-hmm. decided that oh diamonds are forever oh, uh, in branding. fact that, that was their that was their marketing shtick right it's like kind of like coke creating santa claus right they they just created this whole thing that no 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 engagement is diamonds and that's what you've got to do and you've got to spend this much of your salary and we did <laughs> just to touch on that and I, I don't know if this is a thing in gen x but around 2014 if you look on Google Trends, you know, there's a clear increase and uptick, basically sustained uptick, I might add, in Google searches for Sapphire engagement ring. Nice. And I've noticed with now that, you know, my increasing number of my friends are getting engaged. Although I have to say, like the the number of people in millennials, and this is like proven, you know, the people, the order of like get engaged you know, get a house together, have children has been completely disrupted. It's not as common as it used to be. People do things in different order, myself included. The one thing I've really noticed is I thought that I was going to be like, you know, really, really unique and outlier getting a Sapphire engagement ring for Chloe. But yeah, it's become like, I've noticed a lot of other people have Sapphire engagement you set, rings. You set a trend. This. No, it's like, I realized I was just, it's just like how I named my kids really popular names. It's like, you think you're like, oh yeah, I've come up this my own way. And it's like, oh wait, all my friends are calling their kids the same names as me? Gosh, I guess I'm not that unique. Yeah, it's funny actually, Claude, on that topic. We I we came up with like a list of names just from thinking of names. And it's like a very large number in the top 10 names 
popular at the moment. It's like really weird. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Maybe there's like some, we're all influenced by the same thing or there's something going on, but yeah. It's well, I guess a story for another day, but the overlap between me, Matt, and another mutual <laughs> friend of ours, between yeah, our true. children, they're pretty much all just the name, the same thing. Like, <laughs> yeah, yet to have a unique name within the friendship group kind of situation. Yeah, that's funny. Anyhow, the, yeah, the point is that I do actually think Sapphire or even just moving away from diamonds as an engagement ring has been a thing. Like, I think it's been, it kind of got into the popular consciousness at some point that the diamonds weren't always, you know, the most ethical stone to be collecting. And they're actually, Sapphires come in many different shapes and forms. Like, obviously, the classic, most well-known one of the Ceylon Sapphires, but they're all different kinds of Sapphires. They're almost as hard as diamonds. And yeah, you can get something pretty unique and, and custom with sapphires as well very good all right with some some good news out of the way should we do you want to cover what was the stock you wanted to chat about today andrew is that beam oh look i yeah i thought we'd chat a bit about beam only because i just spoke to michael kapoki the uh the ceo recently and dean slee the cfo it's not a company i'd looked at closely before if you're not familiar with it the tickers bcc they do satellite communications they, they do they do equipment and services so it's a company that actually goes all the way back to 2002 some older investors might remember a company called worldreach it was a subsidiary of that they started doing this satellite uh, work for the iridium satellite network anyway long story short they they were the subsidiary that became the the, the main revenue earner and they sort of rebranded sold off everything and just focused on that they did that in 2018 so Five years is, is that specific unit. So, you know, since then they've gone from 11 million in revenues. They just reported $40 million in revenue. They are profitable. They are seemingly well-funded. And yeah, the PE is eight. And the interesting thing is, is that the, they just delivered 60 something percent revenue growth and basically said, yeah, we'll do something similar again this year. You also see that sort of, there is, since 2018, you've seen that widening jaws between operating revenue and OPEX. So they, they're getting a bit of operating leverage there. So it's kind of like, what's the deal? I actually put it to them, like, what gives? What is it? And they're a little bit, little bit sort of, oh, I don't really know. I feel as though they probably did know. <laughs> they're never going to tell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why should we not like you? But yeah. Hmm. I, I mean, like, I, I think we love to, as investors go, oh, the market's always dumb. And it's like, well, it is often does dumb things, but not always. And I think it's a really good place to start to assume the market's right. And then go from then, and then be really confident. If if you think it's wrong, then you know why. Why? What's that variant perception based on? Rather than the market's always dumb, and I'm a genius. I'm the only one out there that can see the truth. <laughs> the other thing, bad footing. Worth, worth noting on that, Andrew, is that the market's always seems to be dumb when it's not doing what the person wants to do. Yes, <laughs> yes. so the true. Is, sometimes it can be doing what you want it to do and still be dumb. And I think actually Beam Communications is possibly an example of that. I'm actually a veteran of when it was called World Reach and managed to get in front of some, I guess, brief re-rate because while you were talking, I looked up my share site. Yeah, like I wish we had some sort of code for that, but whatever, obviously. Oh, yeah, we do. Go, go to strawman.com. Yeah, you can <laughs> find it on the blog of some <laughs> All the rich life articles. There's a, there's like a free trial for share share site. Nah, I got a straw man. Straw man. Straw man's the I've way you want to I'm putting it on because I'm pretty sure all my readers already use it. Anyway, the point <laughs> is that this thing was trading at 17.5 cents in August 2014 when I bought shares, and then I guess it had some temporarily good results because in 2015 I sold it at 35 cents or something like that. Oh, well done. Yeah, I mean, obviously mostly luck, and looks like it was small change I was spending as well, so. <laughs> probably just offsets like the losses I made on equally poor quality micro caps. But it just goes to show like that spike whenever it happened to 35 cents or whatever it went to, like that was the, that was the irrational part, right? Like, because now 10 years later or however long it is, not quite 10 years later, it's back at 20 cents. I guess that, you know, that's something. Yeah. To I mean, it's look, so, so there's, there's two, like, so we're talking about a $70 million market cap here, right? It's like, okay, so what is going on? So the one that I, I sort of asked the question and I, I feel as I, having asked it, it's like, they've, they've had to like answer this a million times, but it's like the elephant in the room, I feel is Starlink, right? Elon's out there. Elon gets a lot of headlines. He's putting all these satellites out there and, you know, it seems like a bit of a disruptor. I can now get high-speed internet anywhere on the planet relatively cheaply and likely to continue to get cheaper. Their response was, well, it's actually quite different what we do. Their satellites actually have 
lot of requirement to be replaced fairly often. The Iridium network has just been refreshed pretty recently. It's more for sort of things where you really need to get through in very remote locations where you could be, you know, in a chasm somewhere and you'll you'll still be able to, to get through. It's like, okay, I don't know enough about the tech, so I'll, I'll take that at face value. The other one that I think you might've mentioned, Matt, was that iOS devices now have a SOS cap- cap- uh, capability inbuilt. So you can just like press a button on your iPhone if you're out in the middle of the Simpson Desert and you know be be pinged yeah. somewhere. I'm not I'm not sure what they must use a satellite network too. I don't know if they use Iridium or, or somewhere else, but it's a similar type of concept. It's more for emergency messaging. And so yeah, if you are in too much of an emergency zone, you can still text and I think even make calls, which is quite incredible just natively through the iPhone. So I, I guess that would potentially be a threat for one part of their business, which is the Zolio. So they've got a beam as a few different products, right? Zolio, which is more like this. It's like a, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, a handheld thing. You like, it tethers to your phone and allows you to send text messages via satellite so that if you're like out lost in the bush or or not lost in the bush, you can like send text updates on where you are. So that product, I guess, could be somewhat threatened by Apple, I'm thinking, because if you could still use this, if Apple has access to a satellite network just via natively via your iPhone, then yeah, maybe for some users, at least they might not need a Zolio. Yeah. So I don't, I don't have an opinion on it because I haven't done the work and there's a lot of digging to be done. So I thought it was just, it's interesting to discuss because, you know, there's been, you look at the operating revenue of the business, there's been a pretty nice staircase shape upward trajectory. They're guiding for some pretty strong growth to continue. So someone's buying it, right? Like <laughs> someone's clearly buying this stuff. Whether that continues or not, the market obviously thinks, I, I, I assume no, but it is profitable growth as well. So it's something that's that's interesting. I can't see the I can't see the business model being fantastic because it seems like this is the kind of thing you'd get very occasionally for one off uses. It's not like something you use every day. It's not your zero subscription. It's not your you know software that you use to do your job. It's like well, except for some very rare people, I imagine. But I think you'd you'd have a lot of people. I mean, just logically unless proven otherwise, wouldn't you have a lot of churn with this kind of business? Because most of the time with someone needs to be able to go out into the middle of nowhere, like it's like, all right, we're doing a trip. We're going out into the middle of nowhere. We're not living there permanently. We're just going to go there. So you so you need it for a certain amount of time, a month or two, and then you might not need it again for 10 years or ever, not one more time in your life. So I wonder what the base, what the, what is the number of natural users that would be continuing users for this? Like, I mean, even stuff like, say, someone who, you know, works for Mater and, and they're driving around to different sites, do, would they want something like this? Or is it just like, no, nah, man, I'm out of fo- mobile phone reception for like eight hours. I'm going to drive back. There'll be other people at the site. I, you know, I'm fine, basically. How often do you really need to be like independently able to contact society like the the main use case that i can think of is you're on an adventure that's like a self you've decided to go on an adventure not like a continuing need yeah i i don't i don't know i mean there will be the oil rig workers the remote mine sites there'll be those kinds of operations but surely those guys have something else sorted out though do you know what i mean like it's, it's not left to these individual devices, wouldn't it be more like, okay, you've got a mine site, we've hooked the mine site up to satellite internet. So your mine site's like your mothership where you can connect. This this is part of the due diligence that needs to be done. All good questions. They do point out in their deck, you know, the enthusiasts, uh, you know, the mountaineers, the yachtsmen, the kind of people who do it on a regular Yacht, basis. Yacht people, that makes sense, right? That's when yeah. you need this. Yeah. So look, look the, 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 here's the thing. There's, there's, clearly, there's clearly a market for it. The question is, what are the alternatives that are out there and how big is that market and how is that market growing and how are they positioned for it? So I guess any company can talk a good talk, but there is something that to date, at least when you look at the business, they have delivered, right? Like they are, they are, they are growing. And, and at the same time that they're growing, the market's going is less and less enthusiastic. So there is a disconnect there. So there's two, there's two possibilities to just point, point out the blindingly obvious, you know, the market's right and that things have been good, but they won't stay good. Or there's an opportunity here. And, you know, I wrote a piece recently that, you know, all good opportunities kind of, you need hairs on it, right? We might talk about ResMed in a moment. You, you have to, ha- when everyone agrees that everything is fantastic, you don't get the bargain, right? So I'm, let, me, let me be clear. I am not saying this is definitely a buy. I, I don't know. I haven't done the work, but I am saying that, that these are the kinds of setups that you kind of need. If you sort of look at something and go, oh, there's a couple things that I'm not quite comfortable with, that's fine, but you're just not going to get the bargain. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I've probably been a bit overly 
harsh without backing it up with numbers. My scepticism doesn't so much arise necessarily because of market reasons. It's, it's just for this kind of little company, I do recommend people look at the cash flow as well as, and that there can be sometimes very valid reasons why cash flow might not match up with profit. But essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, if you've got sustainably, if you, in a sustaining basis, cash flow is lower than profit, then your profits are being, you know, kept in, in sent into some other vehicle other than cash. And in this case, it seems to be payments for capitalized development costs. So when I see that number being at 3.3 million for a $17 million company, like for reference, you know, the ratio of that expenditure to this company's profit is wildly high compared to what you'd think of with as a best of best in class software company. Yeah, I don't know, color me a little bit skeptical. It's strongly free cash flow negative in the last year, um, 5 million cash in the bank. Be interesting to see what does happen. But until proven otherwise, my base case with this is it's just a, a capital raising situation. It's going to need to raise more capital. So you've got to model for some kind of dilution down down the track, I would argue. I asked Dean for some closing thoughts and his he the thing he was very keen to emphasize was how the strength of their balance sheet and how well funded they are. So again, take it for what it's worth. We'll leave this to it. We'll move on, but we'll move, leave this to our listeners. Like, here you go. Something that something that to, to do your homework on. Yeah, very good. There's a there's a funny story that reminded me of it's like you get these PR maxing leaders. Not this is not being by the way a different company, but it's like sometimes you'll find that if a CEO goes out there and tells you, you know, oh how great our company culture is, and then you just go to the glass door and it's like scathing, like you know, management's a <laughs> psychopaths. Like don't know why anyone's leaving good reviews, but they obviously haven't worked in the Australian office or, or whatever it is. And it's just like, yeah, things that make you go, hmm, I think sometimes PR maxes will go out on the front foot with, you know, to try and boast about the area that is least strong because, yeah, you know, for a company that has 5 million in cash, yeah, look, these guys spending 3.3 million just on capitalized development costs. So I wouldn't say they have the strongest balance sheet. And I have, we've mentioned before, I have met with a company during their capital raising who tell me they don't need to raise capital, which I might've talked about before. Which can be yeah, yeah, fun. that's that old chest <laughs> night. Like, I remember years ago, Nearmap was like, yeah, we, we're not make, raising capital. And then like two days later, they they did. Yeah, but this is in, it was like, in the during. newspaper <laughs> saying that they're going to raise capital. And then they were like, no, we're not going to raise capital in response to this newspaper article. And then they did like two days later or something like that. It's like wild. Yeah. Um, anyway, moving on to other, I think uh, you you hinted it there, Andrew. We should talk about ResMed. I think it's kind of an interesting one. We've touched on this a bit before. We were actually super early on talking about these drugs. It was like because it came up in the good news section. It was a very quite a long time ago before before anyone was thinking about them, kind of speculating what impact they could have. So this is the anti obesity weight loss drugs called GL. TLP1, I think they're commonly called. And it came up at Livewire. So we touched on it a little bit last week, but it was an interesting one because the comment at Livewire was there's not a fund manager in Australia who isn't buying the stock, talking about ResMed. At the same time, the share price is falling. The share price is down, what is it, 30 something percent? It's been a very. The company long is down $17.6 billion in market cap mm -hmm. in the last month. Yeah. And so it's basically falling, but Australian investors are all liking it. And I think it sets up that's really interesting battleground where you've got clearly it's it's listed in the US as well. So clearly it's being sold by non-Australian investors, I think. It's pretty safe to infer, probably US based. And my thinking is it's like a, a classic battleground, right? Where you've got two different sets of people. If you're in Australia, you don't see anyone around you using these drugs for weight loss, really. Like there's I think there's maybe one startup that's trying to do it. But it maybe if you're in America, you know, you see a very large number of your peers using these weight loss drugs already. You see demand out there, you see people using it off label. The American healthcare market's like radically different to Australia. It's much more like a consumer market. People are taking it not just for diabetes, which is what it's like label prescription is, but as weight loss. And some of the, you know, the drug Nova Nordisk, which is a Danish company, is soared in value this year. I think it's the second or first largest company in Europe now, which makes is maker of one of these drugs. And there's there's 70 more of these drugs in the pipeline. So there's it's not just one, there's there's a lot more coming. And 
Yeah, I just think it's really interesting battleground. So maybe I'll set up there to get your guys' thoughts on it. But you kind of got Aussies who are more looking at the financials and not having this like, you know, what each side is biased, I guess, in their own way. As Australians, you're not you're biased to not think of this as a big deal because you don't see anyone around you doing it. As as um, Americans, maybe you're biased to think of you could be caught in the hype cycle of thinking it's going to be much bigger than it is just because everyone's talking about it at the moment. Maybe, you know, because of side effects, it'll start to wear off. And you've got a real life example here with ResMed, which if it's if it's all hype, you know, you could buy it at a discount to the price it's normally trading. I think I got that that estimate wrong in market cap. Actually, I just took the fourteen seventy one million shares out, standing, but I'm pretty sure Comsec's given me some dud figures there. So, <laughs> either way, it's it's come down from close to thirty five to twenty two dollars. It's that's a lot for a multi billion dollar company. I think you had really good thoughts, Matt. Like there's this real idea that potentially people who are exposed to different information from what we are have got a better idea potentially than what's going on in Australia. I still can't get my head around, and perhaps there are good resources for this or something, I still can't get my head around this idea that Azempic, et cetera, are this sort of silver bullet. Like I was under the impression that generally speaking, I guess like starving yourself to lose weight isn't medically like advised. It sounds like, you know, people take this quite expensive injection, makes them feel nauseous they don't want to eat it basically enables people to to diet it's still a diet that's making them lose the weight right it's not the drug that isn't making it shed it's just it's making them be able to diet and don't get me wrong you know it is it is hard to go into you know a mode where you're burning fat because your body is like hey give me food give me food especially sugar i would love sugar Ooh, that apple juice Ooh, so good and yeah <laughs> It's very difficult, but just turning that off and then you have to keep taking that or like the voices come back. I don't, I don't know yeah. if it's a silver bullet. I think it's really interesting. I should also just connect the, the line. So the reason Resume is being hit is because it provides products for sleep apnea, which is tied to obesity. And so therefore they're thinking but between people who are selling is less obesity, therefore less sleep apnea and then therefore less demand for the products. And I think there's, I think you can have a few questions around that as well. Uh, so the way GLP-1 works is Claude said it, it actually mod- modulates dopamine levels and that's a really interesting thing because that's led to at least some of the users noticing as we covered on the pod quite a while ago it affecting all part like many parts of their life they find themselves not addicted to anything they're normally addicted to and so they like they find themselves not doing like the splurge shopping that they normally do they find themselves not doing something else and so yeah i think that's a it's an interesting point but there there's been some i guess what's kind of kicked it off because this has been known for a while like these drugs have been building demands been building i think there was some research reports put out which kind of estimated how many people they thought could go on to it and i think it was something like i think it was something like 10 percent of the american adult population was the estimate that they thought by 2030 something and then they kind of worked out worked it out backwards from there this analyst also did the impact on things like mcdonald's by calculating how much less calories people have per day and and you know assuming the impact you know what will that be if people stop eating it have you guys googled a zempic face no, no. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have even thought to until you said that. Yeah. <laughs> Is this a normal thing that you go or you'd heard of this before? No, no. Like I've been researching this thing because I'm actually really interested in actually buying ResMed, believe it or not. I know it's mm-hmm. not really my usual wheelhouse. It's just that, I, yeah, I'm not buying the bare thesis, basically. You can see the shorts rising as well. I'm not saying it's time. I'm not saying I'm buying it now, but like I would... The idea of buying ResMed on a relatively low PE ratio relative to where it's traded for for a decade and also with relatively high short interest, that appeals to me. That does appeal to me. But I think, you know, at the moment, as you say, you know, there's a lot of people that think, you know, that selling ResMed is a way to express their view that, you know, Azempic's massive. Obviously, there are people shorting ResMed um, basically as a way to express their view that Azempic's going to have such a meaningful impact on obesity that it's going to overcome the fact that many people have sleep apnea are simply not treated and and could benefit from it and so you know mate i don't know that i'd like to take the other side of that bet but i really do want to check that i'm not wrong right like it would be uncool if zampic you know actually everyone's like this is obviously fixing everything and everyone in the u.s knows like three people who used to be fat and now they've never been fitter and all this kind of stuff it's just color me skeptical it the there's something on a base level about you know human desires want so badly for there to be a pill 
that that solves their problems and it's just never like okay I'm, i think always... yeah, yeah i actually had this debate sorry to cut you off court. i had this debate no. with someone else early on as well because they were they were saying the same thing and i was just saying well you know, it can like we do we do have stuff where we have pills that magically solve stuff like penicillin kind of magically solved infection and i'm not the saying pill. this is like to be the clear pill, the pill pill magically solved yeah. Children, yeah. <laughs> not to children. Uh, that's that, that's um, a like, real but, success. But let me like, let me yeah, delve yeah. into that. Let me delve into that because on face value, I, that's true. But all of these things, they all have a dark side. So, like, don't get me wrong. You know, I think penicillin, penicillin, penicillin and antibiotics are amazingly good and completely positive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Except, pretty much almost any medication taken the wrong way, taken or you know, taken used in a way that is not ideal can have some kind of downside. The case in point for me would be when I was a kid, I got put on a lot of asthma drugs, which are now no longer used. And it almost certainly, you know, the source of my now immune system issues. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, actually a better way to have treated my asthma as a child would have been just to remove triggers and keep me off these steroid drugs. And, but that would have probably been a little more suffering for me at that moment as a kid, mm -hmm. but it would have probably been long-term for the best. So I'm not against modern medicine. Absolutely not. Absolutely love it, in fact. But these things, they always there always is like a flip side of it. And it's not that I think that sometimes the drug isn't so good and the flip side's minimal. It's just that I'm waiting for the what's the real flip side of a Zempic is basically what I'm I'm yeah. wondering. And I think just the fact that it acts on dopamine feels like it could have negative things, right? I mean, on the, on the other side, I should just add, there's been one other study that came out which shows a whole lot of other really positive things. So like Alzheimer's and heart disease, like a bunch of other stuff, not just tied to weight loss. So yes, but on the flip side just to make your case for you a bit more clear i think the effect it acts on dopamine just feels odd if you think of having something interfere with your dopamine dopamine's our reward hormone it's how we modulate a lot of activity all of our, all the good stuff in life happens with dopamine so yeah i just you know i think it gives me some pause for thought i certainly wouldn't be keen to jump onto them i'd be going the the exercise route but i think a lot of people don't choose that i don't know there's a particularly if you look at america there's a lot the obesity so just some stats on this i think is also interesting to keep in mind i think camera if we covered this on the pod already but the number of the percentage of obese people in america is 42 percent are obese that's more than are overweight so 30 percent are overweight 42 percent obese only 28 percent in a normal weight range which is kind of shocking like you'd kind of think of obesity as a more extreme version you know not like be smaller than overweight but i guess it covers a broader range because overweight's only a certain band before you become obese so it's a huge number of people and i guess yeah if you look at how long some medications can be prescribed in the u.s even if they have side effects there's whole industries if you like whenever you visit the u.s it's like ads for so many drugs on normal tv and then some like l huge list of side effects afterwards it's like by the way you can like have nausea vomiting <laughs> panic nightmares terror <laughs> like, <laughs> and, but these are all still taken so yeah that, i guess that's my only other kind of caveat looking at from australian perspective is that even drugs with side effects can have a lot of uses yeah what the, i think the the lindy effect well, the Lindy principle is a really good one when it comes to drugs. There are some things where we have so much time, so much water under the bridge where, because let's not forget, there are some factors that don't reveal themselves quickly. You know, so it's like every test we've done, it turns like there's no side effect. And then 10 years later, it's like, huh, okay, it has a massive side effect. So that, that's why I think nowadays the, the pill is like the most least controversial drug that's out there. It's extraordinarily safe, extraordinarily effective. It's a really great example of that. So I, I feel as though there's nothing wrong with having some optimism here and some in, and being encouraged by it, but it is way too early for either the pro or the con side of the argument to to be able to say anything sort of definitive. Yeah, I was actually, I was very much on the side of this is overdone. The fact that you tell me that every Aussie fund manager is buying it has now made me pause. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, it's not time That's, yet. It's mm. not time yet. Okay. You need to have a think piece in Livewire about how we avoided ResMed and, and <laughs> then it's the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> it is a weird situation, right? Because it's like it's such a well-known Australian company. Everyone's buying it and the share price is falling. I just think that, yeah, it just it sets it up. Yeah, as you say, like hearing everyone buying it kind of puts you off a bit, right? Like it That's the like, thing. Yeah. Not for sure. I will, like, I will wait make until the guy that's boasting about having sold it then. Yeah, right. exactly. I mean, it does prove the point I was making there, right? You have to have hairs to get a bargain, right? That, that, is, that, yeah. is, that is the setup here. And so, you know, by the time that this argument is resolved, the, the bargain will either will be proved not to have been a bargain or it'll be gone. So 
there you go. Yeah, very good. Just one last thing. I just, uh, you, something you flashed reminded me on YouTube for some reason I've, I got in my feed this video, maybe because I was researching this stuff called Oxycontin Patients Then and Now. And it shows you patients from like 1998 who are like super happy about being on Oxycontin, uh, the pain relief, yeah, yeah, and then okay. like yeah, yeah. follow up with them what happens. So it's like the people from the commercials that Americans would have watched and not very good. So yeah, to making your point yeah, for you. you. You've got to be careful with these things. I think surely they'll, surely it's not going to be bad as Oxycontin though. I mean, yeah, surely yeah, like you can't get worse than literally rolling out heroin. Yeah. <laughs> Just, I just got to make the point. There's a very perverse incentive structure with a very uh, capitalistic based medical system. Like, like you know, you don't want people to be healthy, right? Like, I want you to come back. I want you to keep taking these drugs. Like that. That is how I make money, and that sounds really conspiratorial, but I don't know if it's a million miles away from the truth, to be honest. This is what gets me, right? Okay, say you're, you know, slightly obese, thirty year old. Or not slightly. Say you're an obese 30 year old. You're like, oh, this, you know, fatness is making me not be able to find a partner and et cetera, et cetera. If you take a Zempic, you can probably, like, you know, essentially develop an eating disorder. I don't know it's why. Not it's not an eating like- disorder, Claire. I don't think it's that extreme because it's just, it, it just stops you overeating. So it's like people lose, it takes like a year to lose 20%. So it's, I don't think it's like, it's not like you're vomiting every day or something. I, would, I, I wouldn't go that far. Okay, you, have to lo- you have to eat less to lose weight, right? Like I the, think it depends on, it depends on the, it depends on how you define eating disorder. And I'm no doctor, so perhaps you're right. I'll concede the point, but you basically are able to diet very quickly. And some of the stuff that I've heard anecdotally is people can really shed the pounds pretty fast on it. So like you shed it down really fast. You now have a Zempic face. You you have to you have to keep on taking a Zempic just to maintain this. And now it's it's somehow curtailed your parts of your personality that it, I guess have to do with dopamine seeking. Like I wonder, is that scenario actually going to be better for you to find a partner and settle down happily, or is it worse? And if you do find a partner in that state settle down happily when you're skinny and on a Zempic. Like, does that mean you really truly, like you are definitely have to keep on taking a Zempic forever? Because if you go back to the person you were, you know, more at the mercy of your dopamine urges, you like have a, you have a, you know, a, a massive behavior change basically, and as well as your body changing. So if you're going to rely on this drug and then build your life around who you are when you're taking the drug, that sounds very close to a drug of dependence to me. Yeah. Oh, it is a dependent. You you do and you do you do rebound when you come off it if, unless you make other changes that that is a common thing basically you do regain the weight because you stop having this in addition yep. to your dopamine. And just to bring a bit of science into it as well, it's not, I think people, it is an oversimplification to say you eat too much. It's very much what you eat. I mean, I, I challenge you, I, you know, eat as much fruit and vegetables as you want and try to see how difficult it is to become <laughs> obese, right? You just, and you force feed yourself on that. It's, when you are in, why is America so different? Because they have the highest concentration of high fructose corn syrups and sugars and these these things. They, that is the that is the problem to, to my way of thinking. People who have who have like sensible diets who don't eat things that are made in a factory with all of these additives tend and it's and what I guess the point I'm rounding up to here is that what's interesting and what's increasingly being found is there is not just weight implications here but there are mood implications there are endocrine uh, implications with your endocrine system your hormones and stuff as well it's just it's really not great to be pumping yourself full of a bunch of, of these of these kinds of chemicals beyond the weight consideration just last comment for any american listeners where australians are pretty obese too so it's kind of a universal problem i think 35 percent oh no sorry 31 percent are obese 35 percent are overweight of australians so that means around 33 percent are not overweight or obese. So 67% are overweight or obese. Yeah. Eat an apple and go 72. for a walk, people. That's what, that's what <laughs> happens when you ban cigarettes. Oh, gosh. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> Bring back ciggies. I don't know how that happens. I'm joking. I'm joking. All right, Claude, do you want to take us, through, take us through small, what's going on in small takeover town? Yeah, okay. So I thought we could have a little segment today touching on Look, I do think that we are in an era of having more little takeovers in, you know, micro micro cap land than we have had, you know, for a while, basically. Obviously, you had this huge sell off in, in micro caps from, you know, the COVID hype era when, you know, Wall Street bets was bringing in the least discerning investors that I've ever seen enter the micro cap 
segment of the market Mm -hmm. and these this has all stopped now and it's come a lot of stuff's come down a fairly long way and i think we are starting to see evidence that babies have been thrown out with the bathwater. so the one that comes to mind most for me at the moment is a company that i own shares in i've downgraded it now to sell one third so i'm i'm planning on doing that by the time you're actually listening to this i'll have sold a third of my holding but that has been taken over or it's not been taken over. So it received a takeover offer from Atura, another listed IT services company, essentially. This is not the only, and this is not the only takeover in this industry that we've seen in in the last you know six months or whatever. We had Atura and I think it was Brennan IT get into a bit of a bidding war over MOQ, which was another IT services company, which I didn't follow very well. I don't know if either of you guys did did that what did look at that one a lot. And then you had uh, Tesserent also, which is you would I would just say it's IT services with a specialty in cybersecurity, and that got taken over. But I'm not sure how you say it, Thies or, or whatever. It Ta- is. Thales, the French oh, was it Thales? Um, defense chain. Yeah, yeah. I for- I forgot that's that name. Sorry, but yeah. So I think we've seen a few in that segment. I think. We've probably, there's some going on outside that. We had an offer for a, a large chunk of oh, that company that sells Clorox and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, what's that one called again? Uh, not one we usually usually look at. Have you have you guys noticed any other small uh, takeover situations recently? We've- yeah, and TeleHR was uh, the biggest multiple that I'd seen maybe ever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> The that's premium right. and that was just like absurd. And, and that was the best situation where you get into a bidding war, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. And I mean, it got back to prices that had been before. So it's not like it had been really beaten up before that. People were just waiting for it to have to raise capital. So it's not like um, shareholders who had been in there for a while did amazingly out of you know, that bidding war, but still recovered a lot of ground well above where it had last raised capital, I guess. Yeah, I think that's what you, I mean, that's that's what you want, right? You want a bidding war as the, if you're the vendor, if you own shares, if you want it to sell. I mean, ideally, a lot of the case, as we've said before, we often don't want our companies to sell because we're often looking for significant multi-baggers. We're not trying to close a one-time valuation gap. We want something that can compound for like, not be a micro cap, right? We want a mid and large cap. <laughs> And we want to own it when it's a micro cap. So for those cases, it's almost always a bad thing if they sell before that happens. But uh, yeah, I think if you're going to have a sale go through, you definitely want a bidding war and anything they can do to get that going, I think is important. That was Pentel I was thinking of before, by the way. The one that comes to mind for me, poor old Erode, we got down to 40 cents. Oh, yeah, that's Had a takeover one. offer at like well, indicative, non-binding, et cetera, et cetera, to be fair. But just we're not interested. No, thank you. So shares got up close to dollar fifteen, something like that. And I said, no, we're not interested. Go away. Shares and then said, oh, actually, we're going to... And then, and then and then are now raising at 70 cents a share. <laughs> so it's kind of like, hmm, that, that doesn't seem as though it was handled too well maybe in the fullness of time we'll see we'll see that yeah, i'm less harsh on just the general feature of saying no and then having to raise i think as long as you do the raise in a way that's fair it doesn't really matter that much um what yeah. price the actual raising is i i don't know the details of e-road but i know it's like a snappy point to make but I don't think necessarily a raising price being lower than, you know, a takeover price actually is necessarily a terrible thing. Although in E-Road's case, I, I make no comment. Yeah, no, look, you, you, you're right. I'm being a little bit unfair there, but you can you can imagine the reaction from shareholders is just sort of like, oh my gosh, what is wrong with this? And I thankfully got out. I didn't do, I'm not boasting here because I did not cover myself in glory. It was a loss for me. But then you sort of like we nearly triple. had the nicest little, experience. No, well, it's real. Sh- I mean, we should talk about it one time. It's, sim- it's an interesting little business. Anyway, they, you know, you, you see your your value close to triple, and then you know there is there is something some relief to be sort of had in that, and then to like then to drop all the way back down to sixty cents, and then for them to say actually now we're going to raise some money at seven. It's, like, oh. <laughs> it's not great. Yeah, it's not a great experience. Yeah, and my, 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 I mean another one. We'll see if it works out. But Ultium kind of rebuffed the interest for a takeover offer. So far, I think that's working their favor. Though, yeah. so I think they're a bit above now where that was being rumored to be indicated to be. Didn't look great for a while though, did it? No, <laughs> exactly. Mm. It's a period there. I think it really comes down to is this company you know if they. Are 
are going to become one of those future monsters, you want it to, you want them to say no and, and do it. I just think that what you don't want is a board to just want to hang on to the, on, onto power and hang on to the, you know, growing their, getting their, their happy board seats and running a, a loss making company. That's, it, that's not it is want. true. Whilst I don't always agree with a board pursuing a takeover, you know, generally speaking, if they're trying to orchestrate an exit, at a certain price for everyone you can't really say that's particularly unfair you know they're trying to say look we're all going to get out at hopefully a, a good price so there is that for us on a bad play look i think usually in most market conditions thinking about takeovers as much of a possibility is a mistake and i and i don't generally do it because i think it then if you're looking for takeover targets you're always gravitating towards beaten down stuff which is not the best approach in my opinion but when everything has been beaten down i think there can be a nice alignment of thinking about takeover possibilities whilst also being able to find a valuation framework that works if the company sort of stays listed and and one would hope also you're always in a much nicer position so you know for example and this is actually where i wanted to segue this in as a more general discussion is how do you guys think about managing a position that is now under takeover there are obviously you know the best situation to be in is where you actually would like to hold that company long term, you really love its prospects, you trust them to to keep a steady ship. That's the best scenario. So let's put that aside. In the scenario where your preference is to just keep the company listed, you appreciate the takeover offer, you appreciate the interest other people have in buying your shares, but you don't want to give up your shares. So you're quite happy to just hold on. If you get taken out, you get taken out. If you don't, then well, you got your you got your wish. So let's put that aside. You know, an example of that that happened for me a while ago was PTB, that turbines repair company. You know, I was like, I didn't even engage in the process because I was like, ah, oh, damn, I thought this was going to be a great compounder. And it's like, you get out now, you get taken out now. But what about when you're actually like, okay, well, this was always a thesis that wasn't my favorite long-term thesis. I've now got this much higher share price. I kind of want to get out at this price. How do you guys think about managing that kind of scenario when you do want to be taken out? Yeah, I'll go first. I look, It's like so many things, it comes back to valuation. Right. So what do I think the thing is worth? What does that takeover offer look like in comparison to that? Is it a, is it opportunistic and insulting and then like get stuffed? Is it kind of like, yeah, pretty much what I thought. And it, you know, it's the bird in the hand versus two in the bush kind of thing. It's like, there is something to be said that like, I think it's worth this. My, my basis for that is what I feel as though the company is likely to generate in cash flows over the coming years. But if I can get it all now, you know, yeah, depend, and unless, unless it's super high conviction, as well is yeah, a bit of a consideration. Totally, and so so there's that. The other thing I tend to do, and it doesn't always work out brilliantly, but I'm I'm very much uh, unless there is very strong reason to think that there will be a bidding war of some description. I generally take the money and run. I don't I don't I don't like the idea of waiting for the money to be distributed to me many months down the track because you, you just it's just dead I tend to say you know what even if there's a slight discount to what I will eventually get again time value of money I'll take it right and I get where that does where that does blow up in your face is where you know they they do get a higher offer and you go oh gosh I should have you know would have should have you can't you can't predict that so generally speaking once the takeover offers there but of course you do board, have scenarios where it goes away right it does, and absolutely, and I, I think it only happened. It's only happened to me a handful of times, so there's not really a big data set to to play with here. But I do, I do think that's the, the way that I like to do it. And the other consideration here is there is a value on that takeover. But are we talking cash, or am I going to get the script of some other business that I don't know and potentially don't like, and might not even be listed on the ASA? Like, oh, I don't want to hold something over there, or you know, or even here that I don't necessarily necessarily don't like. So generally speaking, it's it, so just to summarize, if it looks as though it's a re reasonable price relative to my valuation and there's not likely to be a takeover bid and yeah, I'm just, I'll take the money and run. Yeah. I think for me, I think it's kind of probability weighting the different outcomes and like, in, like kind of a scenario is basically like say that the deal flows, falls through, what price do I think the shares will go back to? what you know or what should they be going back to basically and how do i like fit how do i how does that fit into my process so like if it's a company that i think is really takeover offers undervaluing it and if it falls back i'd be wanting to buy more you know that's that's probably one I'd be much more inclined to just hold and kind of see if there's going to be another offer or if it's one where that you know the takeover falls through and I think there's a reasonable probability of that and then the like price would fall dramatically or at least if it didn't fall I would want to sell it at this price then I kind of think that's an easier one so like BWX a few years ago was that for me oh, yeah. 
where it had really underperformed as it had it was the share price had gone down a lot so that i was kind of in that position where it was undervalued on my you know intrinsic value estimate but i don't think they had been executing well i was really unhappy with them and so then this takeover kind of rumor offerish thing came through i was like wow i'm done like this is amazing i get to sell at like a higher much higher price than it was trading i was almost thinking whether to sell at that price like now it's just clearly not something i want to own you know good luck if someone else gets a higher it's price it's not gonna get it. a better exit than that basically yeah yeah exactly out. yeah and and then the whole thing fell through like pretty quickly and the share price i mean it's down probably 90 percent since then i don't know what it is it's like 20 cents now but that thing looked like it was on those last legs last time i looked at it yeah it's not doing well so it was a it t- turned out to be a oh, good i exit. think it might be i see suspension from official like <laughs> oh boy <laughs> suspension <laughs> from official quotation annual <laughs> listing fees wow yeah so they're in bankruptcy they're their notification of receivers that they're, they're done yeah, right. they're totally cool there you go it's a zero there you go all right well good sell <laughs> yeah <laughs> So selling at the takeover <laughs> offer in that scenario was a good decision, I think it's safe to say. But also, I oh no, I don't want to interrupt. I was just going to say, and then, and then on the flip side, if I think, you know, like if it's one that we kind of think, oh, this is actually a fairish price, then it's kind of like, well, what's our probability of a higher one? You know, trying to think that through. I think that's, I don't do a lot of, I think it can be hard to do probability and scenario analysis in a lot of valuations, but I think it because it's so binary around takeovers, I think you can do it a bit more and have some estimates on it. So I just wanted to mention a couple of, I guess, takeover fall through scenarios, because I talked about some live ones, but takeover fall, fall throughs could also be an interesting place to look. Now, I guess one interpretation is that if the takeover falls through, it means there's some nasty skeletons in the closet. But another interpretation might be, I guess this thing's a little bit in play. One interesting one is Infomedia. I would be interested, I don't know if you guys have any off the cuff comments on knowing what you think of that as a quality of a business. It's never quite been there for me to be comfortable where I'll just necessarily want to sit it out. But it did have not one, but two people interested in taking over last year, taking it over last year. And then those offers fell through. And since then, I think it would be fair to say the results have improved, albeit off pretty dumpster fire situation. And on top of that, you you have seen the odd spatterings of directors buying shares, which makes me think that, I don't know, maybe that they are at least forecasting a slightly better couple of years they the company gave both parties access to its data room and all sorts of stuff i feel like they were you know pretty happy with the with the takeover outcome the, this is a company that feels like to me would is maybe angling to be bought in the next couple of years or at least trying sufficiently in order that it, it can fetch a nice price so even though i'm not really sold on the long term vision for that business i'm not against it either and it, it seems kind of interesting uh, do you guys have any thoughts on infomedia you want to share gosh i haven't looked at it for ages been flat Right, pretty much the earnings per share have just been flat. Turn on equities steadily declining. Dividends haven't moved in ten years. I think it's one where a lot of like value guys who are like, oh, I get to own a SaaS company now. Like I think that's like that kind of thing. Like it's like it attracts that thing, and yeah, it just hasn't. Unfortunately, I think it's been it's been a bit of a trap. I guess if you look over the last ten years, right? Like not not a horrible trap, but just a just not getting the growth that people expect, and so just stagnating. So yeah, I think I have looked at it. I do think it still needs to figure out how to kick off its growth again. It's had a lot of change in management. Management. So yeah, that's kind of my high level thoughts on. Can I just say now that now that you mentioned SAS, like that was such. Do you remember? Uh, like you go back ten years ish or so. Like that man, that was such a great setup. Do you remember, guys? We were actually. I think I'll give a little pat on the back here. I think we did all pretty well out of that because there was a real arbitrage, informational or understanding arbitrage to be had there in terms of the market just didn't get the business model. That was amazing, man. And if you were quoting, Buffett doesn't invest in technology. Ah, oh, those were the days. Do you remember? Like, yeah, <laughs> I love remember? it. And, and, and like, if you, if you, if the penny dropped for you, there was just mm. sort of like, oh, this is like, this is that the back best in the mo- days. business model in history. Best business model in history. <laughs> yeah, and no one. don't want to own because it's yeah, technology. And no one wanted to own it. And so- Great. That was brilliant. The trouble is these days is a couple of things. One, every software is SaaS. Like we just got to stop talking about it. Like it's just, that's the model for software. If you've got software, it's on the cloud, right? Well, hold on. I think the dying, the dying opportunity here is companies that are transitioning successfully from license to subscription because it has a short term, like it has a temporary Uh, depressing effect on its revenue. Second point, but yes, but I think what's different now is that everyone's got the memo. 
Everyone yeah, yeah. gets it, you know, and so it's sort of like while you so back in the day when that was happening, it was sort of like it was. Remember, this was the this was back in the pro days. You and Joe, Matt, you're talking about the well, actually, the, the 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 better that zero does, the more that they're going to lose in the short term, you know. And like you're just like, what are you talking about? That's crazy, <laughs> you know. Fourteen dollars. No, what am I talking about? Eight dollars a share, right? For that yeah, damn got thing. Yeah, down too around there. Yeah, you know, and it was just sort of like, but. but but now I, I think, I could be wrong, I think for the most part people get it. So it's kind of like, one, you're not being special because you're SAS. And if you're not SAS, what the hell? And if, if you are transitioning to SAS, like we get it. And, I think and that's what, why you what, have to keep so open as an investor, right? You don't yeah. want to be the guy who's just like curmudgeonly and then just dismissing everything. You want to be open to it and evaluating it. Not so open that you know your brain falls out, but evaluating right. it for what it is. And that's how you see, there'll be there's new business models coming all the time, right? There's, there's new opportunities to find that next thing that everyone hates. Huh? Hundred percent. Well, that, yeah. So that's why I think kind of now is an era when one can when one can think about. I guess is this cheap enough for me, but very cheap to a strategic buyer in in small cap land because we have had a moment where f- for once we're not looking at ARR mo- multiples anymore. At least the market isn't, and instead it's asking about profit. So yeah, I think that yeah that's some, something to look at. I guess maybe one last company to shout out and. Another one in the fall through club, but has perhaps interesting prospects as well is is Cog State. Yeah, actually, just it triggers one other thought: is if you're if you're thinking probability of a bidding war, you want it to be strategic buyers that are making the acquisition because then they're less price sensitive. You don't want it to be like private equity companies who are very price sensitive because they need to get their returns from the price. You want it to be people who are like, this is valuable to me, but because it adds so much more value to my existing business, I can leverage it in some way or solve yeah. some problem. The price I I can pay a much higher price and still be rational. About. Exactly, exactly. That's yeah. idea. And then mm. and then if they get irrational as well, it's even better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah. So Coxay is one that you know we own and I'd mentioned before, and they had, I guess, re- like potential for a takeover. It was never official, officially announced, and there's pr- probably some leaks, I think, probably on the, the acquirer side. But and I think that was more a strategic view. But you've kind of got a left now where it's kind of rebuilding. It's had this slow year. That's why the acquisition didn't go ahead because they had this earnings headwind from some revenue being delayed. But I, I think they're now in a sp- situation where they could be setting up for that it's not a it's not a there's never a core part of my thesis to have a potential takeover but yeah i do think it's something to keep in mind it's always interesting to think about that as like evaluation realization potential in a couple years time if they if all this kind of comes together yeah there's one kind of small company that's profitable albeit no recurring revenue and i just keep looking and i think i wonder if this does have takeover value but i I wouldn't necessarily otherwise know a reason why it would ever get a a higher p p ratio so i guess the reason that I think that now is a little bit different. Is I guess maybe what I'm arguing is, whereas usually my default position would be that low PE ratio is not a catalyst for a high PE ratio, right? Like you can't just be like, oh, this is on five times, it should totally be on eight times. Yeah, but what's going to make it on eight times, you know? You need someone to push it up to that. Yep. That could be a, a takeover thing. And we just happen to be seeing a few more of them lately. So so that's why I mentioned it. I think one one final comment on it. I think the other dynamic that's important for for takeovers is the macro environment, or more specifically, just access to liquidity. They just we the funding isn't as good as it was, you know, back back a year or two ago. And I think is a you need you need a, a lot more willingness. Oh, what's the word for it? We just need a lot more liquidity out there in, in a liquidity constrained environment. Not that they won't happen, especially when there's bargains in plain sight but it will make it more difficult final thought just building on what you said matt but i actually think this is probably the most valuable takeaway from this discussion is i think that strategic buyer question is is key right so with tesseran you could argue the strategic move was that it would take the buyer so long to get that many uh employees who are security cleared for them to build their business, even though they could potentially replicate the business without buying something. It's just a massive time saver to have all of these employees that are approved come over and they can't speed up that government process of approval. And then for something like uh, what we see with Cirrus Networks, I mean, basically, if you've got bigger companies floating around who are doing a roll-up strategy right now, then that's a a positive as well, right? Because that means that you know, swallowing the smaller one could be of strategic value for them, even if there's no, you know, angle like clearances or whatever. Nice. All right. I think that's very good. If anyone has uh, any other ideas for companies that they think could be takeover targets, particularly in micro small cap land, maybe hit us up on Twitter at Baby Giants Pod. And until next time, thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks. thanks everyone. Have a nice day.